Good morning. Welcome to worship today at St. John. So we're continuing through our sermon series. We've been studying through the book of 1 John, this letter that John has written to some of the earlier believers in Christ way back a few thousand years ago. So any story, if you've ever studied literature, or even if you listen to music, you know there's kind of this rising, that building that comes throughout a book or through a good song, which eventually meets with that main crescendo, that climax. And we reach that here in chapter 4. When John goes through and talks all about one simple premise, love. But again, love is multi-layered. There's a lot of different parts of love. So John is going to walk us through, where does love come from? Ah, who is love? What is an example of love? And finally, how do we show love for one another? Which we all know is much easier said than done. So it is great to have you in worship today. We will rise and greet each other with the peace of the Lord. Then you can be seated for our opening hymn. together for our opening hymn 700 love divine all loves excelling hymn 700 
beginnings this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now we join together the call to worship based on Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. Praise Him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise Him with the harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and pipe. Praise Him with the clash of cymbals. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We take a moment to silently reflect upon our lives, whether that be looking at the Ten Commandments, looking at those things, those thoughts, those words and deeds that we've done, or that we've left undone this week. We bring those to our Lord and Father. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. As we always examine ourselves and our sins, something we always probably are guilty of withholding is love. Maybe it's not love for those loved ones that live in our house, but it's those people we pass by in the street or those strangers or that anger that builds up inside of us. We withhold love because we're sinful, because that clouds us from seeing people as God sees us. See, God sees us as forgiven. Why? Because he did not withhold his only son. The greatest act of love God did not withhold because he gave his son. To be that sacrifice for us so we can confidently proclaim that our sins are forgiven because of Christ. Amen. You can be seated as we respond with our hymn of praise, This is the Feast. <laughs>
Today's reading comes from 1 John chapter 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is from God is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and know is in the world already. Little children, you are are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this love, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the, to be the appropriation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Since we're in our Bibles, I'm not going to ask you to stand for the Gospel so you can continue to look. So we're going to turn a little bit back to 752 and the Gospel of John. Now we will not directly address this, I'm not addressing this in my sermon, but I think as we look at love, you see this connection. So vine and the branches is what we're talking about in John 15, and John is going to make this connection with love. That love cannot be apart from God. That you can't have one without the other. I always tell my kids, it's like a tree. You cut the stick off on the ground, you're not going to grow a new tree. I tried that as a kid. It doesn't work. Okay? It needs to be attached to the tree itself. So we read from John chapter 15. This is on page 752 in your pew Bible. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in the vine, in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, 
thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now rise and profess our belief in God in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for our sin and for our salvation came down from heaven and was departed by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand. Continue with our sermon hymn, What Wondrous Love Is This? <laughs>
full confession, I'm not a huge superhero movie fan. Just not my jam. I like some other things better. But if questioned, I'll be honest. I couldn't tell you the difference between Marvel and DC. I realized during my years of youth ministry to some kids, this is a big deal. They didn't really like that. They wanted me to respect and know the difference between the two. But I'm not going to say I'm an expert when it comes to superheroes. But as I've looked and I've read and I've seen some of the movies, I've noticed that there's a very stark common trait among these superheroes. Superheroes have origin stories. They have these significant life events that create them to be who they are. few prominent examples. So first you have Batman. He grows up in Gotham and is known as Bruce Wayne. This is, of course, until tragically his parents are mugged and they're killed. And this leads him to fight a life of crime as he continues to ply his trade. Then next you have Peter Parker, Superman, or Spider-Man. Now, Spider-Man is bitten by a radioactive spider. A little bit weird, but whatever. Well, you can guess what happens next. He also has a death in his family when his grandfather is killed. This, of course, leads him to fight crime. Then finally, you have maybe the most classic, one of the originals, Superman. For his own safety, his parents leave him, send him away from his home planet to Earth, where, of course, his superpowers begin to activate. Well, what I quickly noticed besides their origin is all their origins involve very tragic events. Now, if you've looked at other movies, you notice that this isn't just specific to superheroes. Disney also loves doing this. Usually in Disney, within the first 10 minutes, you notice a parent dies, someone moves away, something significantly bad happens right away. Now, I believe this is totally intentional. See, what I believe what this does is this draws us in to the characters. See, with superheroes, we can't relate with the flying. We can't relate with shooting out spider webs from our hands to fly through buildings. And with Disney, we can't relate with being a princess stuck in a castle. But what we can relate with is heartbreak. Things involving love or involving loss draw us in. See, we can relate with the human side of superheroes. Now, I believe something else that pushes our interest is our thirst for knowledge. See, we see how amazing these superheroes are, and we're like, how did they get to be that way? What happened to them? Or how did this princess or this person on Disney get to be who they are? We care about the origin. And even if you don't care about the origin, the movie box office would argue against it. If you look at the 10 top grossing movies of all time, five of them. Half of them are superhero stories. So we buy in to these stories. We care very much when it comes to origin. And the origin we're going to talk about today isn't of superheroes, but instead it's something that's far more important that relates to each and every one of us. It's simply love. The origin of love. And as we've worked through the book of 1 John, today we reach John's big crescendo, that big moment. See, in this chapter, I believe he says what is the most important thing he wants his readers to know. So if you go up your Bibles with me, we'll go back, we're on page 856, and we're going to again go to 1 John, and it's chapter 4. Now, I'll be honest today, I am skipping the first six verses, okay? Forgive me for that, but as we've talked, John's letter is very circular. So what John does, he's already kind of talking about how you test the spirits in chapter 2. So he just kind of concludes that part. And then he moves to this section that focuses on love. So we're in 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to pick up from verse 7. John starts, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. See, right from the beginning, it's like John drops the lead. Love is from God. See, this is love's origin. This is where it all starts. Then John continues in the next verse. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. In verse 8, whoever does not love God does not know God because God is love. See, very simply, John takes it further right away. Not only is God love, but the fact that we can love 
is dependent on God. See, our ability to even love in the first place depends on God. See, this is important. Because I'll be honest, as I look at our culture, we have a fascination with superheroes, but we also have quite the fascination with love. However, generally when we talk about love, I don't believe we talk it in the same context of what John is saying. My prime example, February 14th. What is that day? It's our national holiday for love, right? Put it on the calendar, Valentine's Day. But that love that a lot of times I see on Valentine's Day isn't the same love that God's talking about. It's this love to one another. We kind of take God and we put him over here so we can focus on this earthly love. Very rarely is that that sacrificial love. It's instead a chance to buy chocolates and to buy those flowers. I would highly argue that that is not what John's getting at. And it's almost as if John knows we're going to kind of get distracted with our definition of love. So he brings us right back to verse 9, and he continues with this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, right here, I believe John is making it very plain. God didn't show his love through his, just his words or just a gift. God showed his love by sending his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, this is the greatest act of love. This was a world-changing act of love. See, to God, love is active. It means doing something, and that something was sacrifice. And the greatest sacrifice anyone can give is laying a life down for someone else. See, back as I imagine the first readers who read John's first, this letter here in 1 John, something they knew was sacrifice. See, not their sacrifice, but the sacrificial system that the Jewish people had lived under for hundreds and hundreds of years. See, there was a regular pattern in the lives of people at that time. They would sin. And what they would then have to do is make a sacrifice. An animal would need to be sacrificed to atone for their sins. They would place their sins upon the animal. They would sacrifice. Well, what's the problem? They'd always sin again. And then they'd sacrifice an animal again. And then they'd sin again. They would start this never-ending cycle of sin, repentance, atonement, and sin again. There was no reprieve. See, this is why the city of Bethlehem, before Jesus was born, was famous for one thing. It's spotless lambs. See, outside the city, this is the, where the lambs would be raised with the sole purpose of being sacrificed in the temple in Jerusalem. They were sacrificed as an atonement for the sins of the people. But God would be the one to forever break this cycle. He would break this cycle by sending his one and only son to earth. And where was he born? Of course, in that city of Bethlehem. And he was sacrificed too, but he wasn't sacrificed in the temple. He was sacrificed on the hill outside of the city on the cross to be the atonement for our sins. That's love. And this is how God showed his love for us and how John defines love. So then the question is, how do we respond to this act of love? Well, John continues in verse 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought out to love one another. See, God's love, the thing he did, required an action. It required a reaction for us. And our love on earth requires the same. As God has loved us, we are now called to love others. And very simply, that's a problem. See, I go back to Valentine's Day, a day that we generally show love for people we already care about. But every February 14th, I'm usually in the store not buying gifts. I don't buy gifts on that day. I just skip it, okay? I will buy gifts on other days. But that evening, it's always filled with a certain group of people who are buying those last-minute gifts, grabbing the chocolates, grabbing the flowers, grabbing that one card that really doesn't fit in, but it's the last one on the shelf, so they grab it. But my question is this. Is this really the love that God's talking about? Kind of an afterthought, 
a leftover. Now, here's my goal. Don't get me wrong here. I am not calling out those last-minute shoppers. I am not trying to guilt you. Valentine's Day was a long time ago. Right now, it's April. What I'm trying to get you to see is this. A lot of times, we have an unfortunate shallowness in our earthly love towards one another. See, on Valentine's Day, you're shopping for people you've already probably said the words, I love you to. Yet even then, many times our actions ring hollow. Which then begs the question, how do we appropriately love one another? How do we even do that, which seems so simple? Well, very simply, John says, we have to go back to the origin. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. Now this always seems weird. How have we not seen God? What John's getting at is in his full glory, no one could see God. Back in the Old Testament, God spoke through a burning bush, through visions, through all these different things. No one could see the full glory of God. It was that amazing. So he's setting the basis. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. So to love others, we need help. Because love is not natural to us. See, we are predisposed instead to sin and harm. So very simply, we need God. We need that connection with the originator of love. And thankfully for that, God had a plan. He gives us his Holy Spirit. We all have that spirit living inside each of us. And love is only possible because of that. Now, this is a part where I want to look, because we go, we've been studying through the scriptures, we've looked through 1 John, there's a word there that you won't find, and it's the word Trinity. Matter of fact, you're not going to find that word anywhere in the scriptures, the word Trinity. But this gets to who God is. A few weeks ago, we had our confirmation kids stand up here and saying, we believe in the triune God. Well, if triune or Trinity doesn't show up in the Bible, and we as Lutherans believe so much in the scriptures... How do we show this? How do we prove this? How do we look at this? Well, of course, we use God's word. See, we just had the Holy Spirit mentioned in verse 13 here in 1 John. But listen to where John goes next in verse 14. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. See, right there, we have two Bible verses right next to each other. But clearly stated this. The Father has given us the Spirit... The Father has sent His Son to be the Holy, to be the Savior of the world. This is the triune God. God, three in one. And I would argue this is God's origin story. Now, God's origin story, we don't know the whole story. Why? Because the Bible begins with three simple words, in the beginning. What was before the beginning? We don't know. But we know there was God. And there was also love. Because God created. Present in the very beginning were the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That relationship existed and there was love. Because unlike us, love is natural to God. God has this relationship that exists within himself. Three distinct persons and yet one God. This is the greatest mystery in our Christian faith. I've had to preach multiple times already on Trinity Sunday, and I always say we're not meant to understand it. No image is meant to help us understand God, and that's okay. But in their relationship, the three in one, we see the unity in the Father as both the source and the goal of of their work. Because out of love, what happens? The Father sends his Son, and together they send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then brings us to Christ, who in turn shows us the Father's love. See, as we talked about that cycle that existed within the Jewish sacrificial system, I would argue here we see a different cycle. The cycle of God's love for us in action. Through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each one helping us to love God and to love one another. See, now John, after all this, maybe technical terms, gets us back to simplicity in the next verse with three simple words. God is love. See, I read this in verse 16 like God is just, John is reinforcing the most important thing he wants us to know. 
He doesn't want his readers to forget this. This is already the second time he said it. And he wants us to know in a sinful, difficult world, which we live in, that this is where our hope needs to be directed. To the God who loves. And I think in our world today, this is especially important. Because we live in a self-help culture. We're always looking at ways to better ourselves or improve our way of life. I'd say another way of putting this is we're always looking at a better way to love ourselves. But even this can't happen without God. God is love and we need to go to the source. Now, I believe a great image of this is God's love is that of an ever-flowing stream. So you can click the slide one more time. God's love never stops flowing towards us. God's love continues to wash over us and remind us over and over again. No matter the sin, God is love. No matter the situation, God is love. No matter the struggle, God is love. And God has made us to share that love with one another. And if we withhold love, well, John reminds us in verse 20 what that means. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. See, our love on earth towards each other is also meant to flow like a stream. We weren't created to be a tepid pool of stagnant water. We weren't meant to keep love only to ourselves. We are instead meant to share that overabundance of God's love with others. And the only way we do that is through the Holy Spirit working inside of us. Letting other people know that Jesus Christ was sent to be an atoning sacrifice for their sins as well. That is love. That is why how we love is we completely and we continue to point people back to the originator of love who has the best origin story ever. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who loves, redeems, sustains each and every one of us in our faith and in our, in our love towards Him and towards one another. Amen. At this time, I'll invite our ushers forward with our offering. And just kind of as we reflect with our reflection question, I don't have it on the screen, and I just think... The important thing is we look at love. I think we always go different places with love. We always struggle with that. But I think this week, a simple task is just reading through 1 John here, chapter 4. Read through it multiple times. See again and again, when it comes to love, it comes to God. Because I'll be honest, if you filled out your sermon notes, this might have been the easiest sermon note fill out ever. But I think it was also meant to be. It's the simplicity to remember that love comes from God. So this week, just take that opportunity. See how many times, how many times can you read through this chapter? 1 John chapter 4. I'll invite our ushers forward now to receive our offering.
rise for prayers. After each petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, your response will be, hear our prayer. Let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, today as we focus on love, we remember that love originated with you. It originated within that relationship, God, and you took a part creating this world and creating humanity. And we are truly that object of your love, God, even though we sin, even though many times, God, we don't love you, we know that that doesn't change your love for us. So help us, God, to be intentional. Help us to remember that love and be able to share that love with one another. A lot of times there's things we withhold, and I'd argue they all begin with withholding love. Then it goes to forgiveness and withholding hurt and different things that are in our past, God. So help us to just remember that you don't hold anything against us. You have forgiven us of each and every sin, and we are meant to live out that life as a new creation and showing that love and that forgiveness to one another. So God, just quite simply help us to love. Lord, in your mercy. And God, continue to shower your love and your care to each and every one of those who are on our prayer list. This morning we bring to you Farrah Laney, Wayne Manteuffel, Wendy Krails, Pastor Brad Bertel, Bev Yake, Paulette Kostetska, Joan Lerke, Bill Evans, Joe Biebighauser, Catherine Stender, Doug Feltman, Celeste Shug, Brian Krails, Gary Lick, Melba Lemke, Darren Good, Arlene Block, Todd Schultz, Gail Tim, Jean Thomas, Lauren Podal, Carmen Mazenbring, Dawn Berge, Yvonne Nelson, Nikki Buckentine, Kurt Braun, John Procknow, Steve Evans, Lori Storms, Gary Radke, and Cindy Beck. God, in these difficult moments of these, these different people with your children, God, please remind them of your love, of your presence in their lives, God. And it's in your, if it's in your will, also bring them the healing that they seek. Lord, in your mercy. God, we praise you today and just celebrate um, just the showering of love as we get to celebrate the baptism of both Jenna and Carter Schaefer this weekend. We just ask that you wrap that family in your love and help both of them just continue to be raised in the faith and receive that support, God, to just know that you love them. And this week we just celebrate that Holy Spirit calling them to be your own. Lord, in your mercy. And God, the time we maybe need to feel that love the most is when we experience loss. Uh, today, we just ask that you continue to be with the family of Nathan Durant, friend of Nick Lundgren, who passed away last week. And you also, God, be with the family of Larry Vogel, brother of Steve, who also passed away this week. God, in those difficult moments of grief and, and of loss, continue just to remind those families, those friends, of the sure and certain hope love, and love we have in Jesus' death and resurrection. As we read today, that was the atoning sacrifice that broke that cycle of the sacrificial system to be that one and ultimate sacrifice for our sins, that our hope and our salvation are solely placed in your hands. So just remind these families, wrap them in your love this week. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, God, we join together in that perfect prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. So today, we get to celebrate that greatest reminder of God's love, the proof of his love with his death and his resurrection on the cross. As I said, the Father did not withhold anything, even his one and only Son. That was done out of the love God has for us, to remind us that our sins are forgiven. And we get to celebrate that each and every time we come to the table of communion. That God invites us in, God invites us to that table and offers us salvation through his son. So we go to God in prayer as we prepare our hearts for communion. With repentant joy, we receive salvation accomplished for us 
by the all-availing sacrifice of Jesus' body and blood on the cross. Gather in his name, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with both your word and your spirit. Grant us to faithfully eat his body and drink his blood as he bids do in his testament. To you alone, God, be all glory and honor and worship. With the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. And when he given thanks, he gave to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the cup in the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. You can now be seated. Just a quick reminder of our communion practices here at St. John's. Our ushers will come down the middle. They will dismiss you. You'll receive the bread at the center from our pastoral team. Then you'll receive the wine at the tables from our, our ushers. And then you can dispose of your cups on the outside. So we will have a song to prepare us for communion.
Now, may this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in the one true faith until life everlasting. Amen. Now, receive the blessing from our Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you now and always his peace. Amen. We join together in our closing hymn, Sent Forth by God's Blessing. Mm -hmm. 